Welcome everyone. My name is Bridget Farrell. I'm the Training and Education Manager here at Heidelberg Engineering. I would like to welcome you to our webinar this evening, Utilizing OCT as Dynamic Assessment and Education Tool, presented by Dr. Sean Cabusi. Dr. Cabusi completed his residency at Yale University and his Vitriol Retinal Fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine. He currently serves as a Clinical Assistant Professor at University of Texas Medical Branch and practices privately in the Texas Medical Center in Houston. Thank you, Bridget. It's great to be with you all. Um, so I'll be talking today about uh, imaging and how I use it in my practice. Uh, my disclosures are here relevant to this talk is that I consult and speak for Heidelberg Engineering. And our objectives for today's talk, uh, number one, we're gonna start by learning how to identify vitreous opacities using the infrared video feature on the Heidelberg unit. After that, um, we'll learn about how we could use imaging, OCT, and other modalities to improve patient education that more accurately demonstrates the etiology of a visual disturbance and presents that etiology to the patient in a visual fashion. And then finally, we can discuss how that we uh, enhance preoperative surgical decision-making treatment decisions uh, through our use of imaging. So I have a lot of interesting cases to go through. I'll try to get through as much as I can today and touch at least a little bit on all three sections. So after several years in a large group practice in Houston, I moved to the Texas Medical Center here, which is the largest medical center in the country, right in the middle of Houston, which is the fourth, fourth largest city in America. And this is my little slice of the med center right here. This is my office where I'm sitting right now. Um, so this is a Methodist hospital office building and uh, it's attached by a bridge to the Methodist Hospital. Down here is one of the largest ERs in the city. So we get a lot of interesting cases come through here. And when I was starting my practice, I really wanted to be in one of these two office buildings that were connected. And so uh, if you look here at the date, this is May 5th, 2020. This was the only available unit in those buildings. And so this was the floor plan that I had to work with. We have a check-in area here and uh, three exam rooms and then there was this uh, back sort of office area that wasn't being utilized and so I decided that I was going to have patients worked up in one of these two rooms then they would come back to this room where they would have their imaging done and this was sort of like the center or the heartbeat of the practice I would see the patients in this room immediately after their imaging and then if they ended up needing an injection, then I would move them back over to this injection room, which was set up for procedures here. So this was my um, imaging and consultation room simultaneous, uh, this back room here. And so it was in this room where I started to really take a unique interest in retinal imaging. In my prior practice, you know, I didn't do any of the imaging. We had a large staff that helped us um, with that task. But when I was just starting off, it was me and one other employee. Uh, we were a very small, lean practice. And so while the employee was up in the front, I was in the back here taking my own images while the practice was just starting off and wasn't very busy. And so I got to learn exactly how to optimize image quality. And I learned various things by taking the images myself. And a lot of them are reflected in the cases today. One of those things was infrared video for vitreous opacity. So we'll talk about that now. So when I was acquiring the images, what I found was that the still infrared photo that would come along with the OCT that I was acquiring, it didn't accurately reflect the vitreous opacities that I saw on the live video feed. So this is the same eye. And then you can see here on the left that there are significant vitreous opacities obscuring the macula intermittently. And there's absolutely no sign of it here on the still infrared photo. So I, I compare it a little bit to the uh, political Texas concept of redistricting where you strategically move certain things into and out of certain areas in order to achieve some sort of advantage or disadvantage. And you know, it was analogous in this case because it had been as if the floaters were redistricted outside the macula by that random still infrared photo. Um, this was the only semblance of it on that on that photo, but if you take a still photo at a different time, it might show it differently. So here's another example of how the video feature shows the opacities and how they behave a lot better than just a still photo. Uh, 
the infrared video had distinct advantages over traditional imaging methods. Uh, a color fundus photo, for example, it can be difficult to visualize the vitreous opacities against the orange background. You can see it better if the opacities are severe, um, but it doesn't capture intermittent foveal obscuration. And the same is true even with an infrared still photo, even though there is a little bit better contrast between the black opacity and the grayish fundus background. With OCT macula, it's excellent for identifying whether or not there's a PVD, and I'll discuss that in greater detail soon. Um, but the OCT macula often fails to capture any vitreous opacities, especially if there is, in fact, a PVD. And then with traditional exam methods, such as biomicroscopy, either with a 20 diopter or a 90 diopter at the slit lamp, um, that's very much limited by patient comfort and cooperation. It can be extremely uncomfortable for the patient with the bright light, and they may be moving their eyes in uh, different directions than where you want them to look. So um, in looking at infrared video, I developed a macular vitreous opacity score based on the video to quantify the vitreous opacities. Number one, in terms of what percentage of the macula was obscured and whether or not the fovea was obscured at least 50% of the time. So I started off uh, with eight categories here, grade one being less than one fourth of the macula was involved, grade two being less than one half of the macula was involved, grade three being more than half but less than 75%, and grade four greater than 75% of the macula involved, and then whether the fovea was involved 50% of the time or not during the duration of the video, it was either a yes or no. These were the results. It was 52 patients, and it turned out that the um, only category that had a distinction between the fovea being obscured 50% of the time or not was the grade two category, where it was under 50%, but greater than 25%. The other categories like grade one, grade three, and grade four, had either no all the time or yes all the time because these were obviously the larger floaters. So here are some examples of the uh, various grading going in order from smallest to largest. So this is a grade one still photo on the left, infrared video on the right, and you can see there's a little bit of a Weiss ring. I'll play that for you one more time. So the video shows better the movement and the involvement of the opacity. Here's another example of a grade one, less than one fourth of the macula is involved. And you can see the opacities for the most part are not involving the macula and certainly not the fovea very often. Here's another grade one, look very carefully off to this side or you may miss it. This patient was complaining of an individual dot in their vision and you just have that dot flying by. I'll play it one more time right there. Maybe it was a, a vast in silicone bubble. And so now we'll move on to a grade two. This is greater than one fourth of the macula involved. And this is a 2A, so the fovea is not obscured 50% of the time. But these floaters are a little bit larger than the grade one floaters. Here's another grade 2A, greater than one fourth of the macula is involved, but the fovea is not involved 50% of the time, but these floaters are larger than grade one. Here's another grade 2A, larger than grade one, about one fourth, between one fourth and one half of the macula is involved. And now let's move on to 2B. So these are still one fourth to one half of the macula involved, but now the fovea is obscured 50% of the time or more. So you can see that there's something involving the fovea here most of the time. Here's another example of a 2B. And you can see that this swirl of floaters, for the most part, is involving the fovea. And again, this is a great example of how the still infrared photo really does not do it justice. So let me show you that 2B one more time. Here's the third example of a grade 2B. Again, there's really nothing here on the still infrared photo. But then look what happens when you play the video. And you have this large swirl of floaters that's in front of the fovea most of the time, more than half the time for sure. So now this is a grade three. There are opacities that involve more than half of the macula, and you can see them better when you activate the video. 
play that for you again. Here's another grade three on the still photo. You can see a Weiss ring type opacity here nasally. But then when you activate the video, there's a large circular opacity here that might not have otherwise been visible. Here's another grade three, large opacities involving more than half of the macula and obscuring the fovea more than 50% of the time. Now grade four opacities very commonly are hemorrhagic PVDs. And so this was a patient that had a hemorrhagic PVD, more than three fourths of the maculas involved. And here's another hemorrhagic PVD, almost the entire macula is involved with that big clump. So in order to acquire an infrared video, on this newer model that I have, you go to the control panel, you select infrared, you don't need the OCT turned on. So just the infrared, you select that, highlight it to turn it blue. You go to movie max, and then you hit acquire. And then what I ask the patient to do is I have them look straight ahead to focus on the blue target. Then I have them look up and then look back straight ahead, then look left and then look straight ahead, look right, then look straight ahead, look down and look straight ahead. And then a combination of those movements will activate the floaters to give you an accurate video and a more complete picture of how their floaters are behaving in relation to their macula. And then you take the average time that the floaters are involved with the fovea during that video and that's how you get your score. So take home point, infrared video enhances the assessment of the quality and quantity of vitreous opacities and a grading scale such as the MVOS can assist in standardizing the documentation of vitreous opacities. So I'm working on writing up this grading scale and I'll be submitting it to a retina journal shortly. All right, so now we'll move on to the next section, which is patient education. I use um, retinal imaging quite a bit in the patient education, going back to the simultaneous um, imaging and consultation when I was doing it in the same room. Um, it's nice to be able to turn the monitor to the patient and show them a visual of exactly what's going on and, and so that they can actually um, see what's happening in their eye. And then you can even compare pre-op and post-op photos as well. So one of the indications for um, showing patients an example of their pathology is the vitreomacular interface. And so I alluded to this earlier, but the uh, OCT is excellent for confirming PVD status, whether or not there's a PVD. So um, the Heidelberg unit does an excellent job of identifying the posterior hyaloid layer, which is here. And you can see in this patient that the hyaloid is mostly down. There's a little bit of elevation between the hyaloid and the retina there. So this is a younger patient that has the start of very early PVD, but this is considered an incomplete PVD. Here's another patient. It can be sort of hard to tell at first glance what's the status of the vitreomacular interface here. But if you look very closely, there's a slight lift in this area. So this is also a young patient that has a incomplete PVD. The posterior hyaloid, the vitreous is still down in contact with most of the macula here. Here's another example of an incomplete PVD. There's a little bit of posterior hyaloid lift right there above the retina and this space right in here but a lot of the posterior hyaloid, the vitreous is still down on the macula. So this is an incomplete PVD. And this is one of the rare examples where you can actually see some vitreous opacities on the OCT, the cross section itself. More opacities on this OCT. This is an incomplete PVD. You can see the posterior hyaloid is lifted here, but is attached here. If you look at the date on this, this is uh, October of 2021. I actually just saw this patient today and the posterior hyaloid is still in exactly the same spot. He's monocular, he has um, amblyopia in the fellow eye, so this is his good eye. Um, and he developed an operculated hole in the periphery, which I lasered previously. And um, I'm watching this eye every six months. Here's another eye that has an incomplete PVD. You can see the posterior hyaloid layer is lifted here and is attached there in the temporal macula. Here's another example of a patient with an incomplete PVD in one eye. 
you can see slight lifting of the posterior hyaloid there. Don't be fooled by this empty space. This is the premacular versa. If you're extremely zoomed in, you may think there's a PVD just in this area above the fovea, uh, but in fact, you have to look at the entire macula and even the optic nerve. But in the fellow eye, this eye has a complete PVD. There's no hyaloid remnant here. Here's another example of an incomplete PVD and some punctate vitreous opacities. Here's an incomplete PVD with another premacular bursa. Here's the posterior hyaloid lifting. Another premacular bursa, posterior hyaloid there. And incomplete PVD at the fovea and the optic nerve. These are two of the last areas that tend to release in the evolution of a PVD. So let's skip ahead. I think we get the idea. Um, so here's a patient that has incomplete PVD and the vitreous is certainly misbehaving a little bit. It has um, pulled apart a full thickness macular hole, but there is still a hyaloid attachment at the optic nerve. So this helps us in surgical planning and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Here's a patient with a complete PVD, another complete PVD, no hyaloid attachment to the macula or the optic nerve. And so let's skip ahead a little bit now complete PVD as well as some microaneurysms and exudates in the outer retinal layers. Uh, oftentimes you'll find epiretinal membranes in patients with complete PVDs and that's what you see here, this hyperreflective layer at the inner retina as posterior hyaloid remnants settle down on the retina and form a membrane over time. And you can see this sort of uh, yellowish glistening on the Heidelberg multicolor fundus photo here representing the the circular epiretinal membrane in the central macula. Here's another epiretinal membrane. This one is a slightly elevated. It's exerting traction. You have loss of the foveal contour here, distortion of the outer retinal layers. So this patient had a vision decrease to about 2070. And you can see on the multicolor fundus photo, these retinal striae that correspond to these inner retinal folds on the OCT. Here's another epiretinal membrane, this inner layer hyperreflectivity with a partial thickness lamellar macular hole and cystic spaces in the temporal macula. So take home point for this section is that OCT can very effectively demonstrate PVD status, which helps with patient counseling and symptom monitoring. So now we'll talk about the peripheral vitreorenal interface. You know, we very commonly get an OCT macula on most of our retina patients, but the OCT can actually be quite useful for uh, identifying peripheral retinal pathology and uh, determining whether or not there is subretinal fluid or early retinal detachment. This patient was referred to me for a quote unquote uh, atrophic hole and uh, with supposedly subretinal fluid, but uh, the OCT confirms that the full thickness atrophic hole does not have any associated subretinal fluid. And in fact, the retina is attached on both sides of it. Another patient was referred to me for a horseshoe tear and clearly there's subretinal fluid in the area of the horseshoe tear. This is the retinal pigment epithelium. This is a right eye and it was temporal. And here is the retina that's elevated with a little disruption here in the area of the tear. Here's a nice fundus photo of a horseshoe tear, a patient that came in with flashes floaters and a large hemorrhagic PVD. Uh, we were able to get this patient lasered in the clinic without surgery because he was fortunate that the horseshoe tear was just outside the area of the vitreous hemorrhage. So we were able to get the laser all the way around the tear here. This patient was referred for multiple horseshoe tears. Uh, they thought that there was subretinal fluid and early retinal detachment, uh, but the OCT confirms that it's just a flap of the horseshoe tear and the peripheral retina is laying down against the retinal pigment epithelium here, no separation, no early retinal detachment. This patient also had a hemorrhagic PVD. You can see these vitreous opacities on the still infrared photo. Here is that first horseshoe tear after 360 laser. It's nice to be able to show the patient a before and after. 
these uh, bright white laser, fresh laser burns, which will eventually evolve into pigmented laser spots. On the OCT, you can see how the laser actually affects the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium, and you can explain to the patient how the laser works. Uh, basically, the argon or yellow laser, it targets the retinal pigment epithelium and heats it up and creates a full thickness scar between the RPE and the retina, fusing them together. So the torn area of the retina, you can see there's still some integrity of the retinal layers, but then those retinal layers are completely lost here in the area where it's lasered on both sides of the tear. And the RPE is more hyper-reflective, bright white on either side of the tear, and that's due to the laser. You can see more hyper-reflectivity here on this photo, and a portion of the tear is starting to opercolate. It's starting to separate as it's being pulled by the vitreous into the vitreous cavity. But because the tear has been lasered, the operculation will not result in a retinal detachment. So take home point for this section is that OCT confirms the presence or absence of vitreoretinal traction and or subretinal fluid associated with perif peripheral retinal pathology. I also use retinal imaging quite a bit in preoperative and postoperative counseling. So in that patient that I presented earlier with the horseshoe tear, it's useful to be able to explain to the patient what's happening in terms of the pathology, why the retina is elevated and what we need to do about it, and to show the patient where the retina needs to be instead of where it actually is. You can sh show the patient a post-operative photo after the laser of the laser marks to show exactly what we did and why. So here's the flap of the retinal tear. This is the anterior flap, this is the posterior flap, and these are fresh laser burns going all the way around it. Another example here, 360 degrees fresh laser. And you can show them the OCT, the before and after. So we touched on that earlier. Here's another example of post-operative laser. This is a patient who had ocular trauma and required retinal detachment repair with silicone oil. And you can see the focal hyperreflectivity of the RPE with overlying atrophy of the retinal layers in the areas that have been lasered. So this was that multiple horseshoe tear patient I showed you earlier. And then afterwards, you can see the bright yellow fresh laser burns surrounding all of the tears and confirm that there's no subretinal fluid beginning after the laser with hyperreflective scars. And you can move your slices further and further down. So you start with the more superior slice, work your way down and work your way down. And you can see that all tears are covered by the laser with appropriate chorioretinal scarring. Here's the fundus photo of a patient with a bullous retinal detachment. And I really like to use fundus photos in combination with OCT and this eye model for patient education to explain what is a retinal detachment, what's happening in the patient's eye, and what we need to do about it. It's especially useful when you need to inject uh, silicone oil or intraocular gas. You can demonstrate um, where the tear is in relation to the macula, to the optic nerve, to the lens and how post-operative positioning comes into play. Gas and oil, they all float to the top of the eye, and so we want those bubbles to float towards the area of the tear. So here's a preoperative OCT of a patient with a uh, macula splitting retinal detachment. The fovea was attached, but you can see here that the superior macula is detached. This is elevated retina, and here's subretinal fluid of the detachment, and then this is the RPE, retinal pigment epithelium. And so something like this is extremely useful for determining optimal surgical timing. You know, if this is a morning clinic patient, ideally they would be in surgery that afternoon. Here's a post-operative photo after retinal detachment. When we use the gas bubbles, it's nice to be able to capture that on a photo. So here is a gas bubble. The gas bubbles resolve. Um, when we examine the eye, the gas bubbles, we see it floating towards the top 
the meniscus goes higher, higher, higher towards the top um, as it resolves and when you see it on a photo. But when you examine the patient, the image is flipped. So the, it looks as if the gas bubble is going lower. And that's also the case with what the patient sees. The patient sees um, what they consider like a water line or a meniscus going lower, lower, lower in their vision until it disappears because the image is flipped. So if you can capture that on a photo and explain to the patient why they're seeing it that way, that's extremely useful. This is another post-operative retinal detachment. And there is a slight hyperreflectivity here um, at the inner retina, at the macula. And you may think it's an epiretinal membrane, but there's a little bit of a yellow glistening without retinal striae. And this is, in fact, a silicone oil meniscus with silicone oil reflection here on the fundus photo. And this is the same eye, just a slightly different slice. And you can see that the white meniscus shifts depending on what angle the OCT is taken. Here's another silicone oil meniscus in a patient with ocular trauma. They had an intraocular foreign body with extensive pre-retinal scarring in this area. But this white line here is the meniscus, and this is the attached macula. So here's that epiretinal membrane I showed you earlier, and um, the OCT and fundus photos are both useful for preoperative, uh, postoperative counseling. Patients love to see it before and after, and I love to show patients that to show them uh, anatomically what we accomplished during the surgery. So the thickness measurements are also quite useful with the thickness of the macula and microns and the heat map showing the thickest areas in white and red. So these are the pre-op photos, and then when you go to the post-op photos, you can see a nice contrast where the epiretinal membrane is absent over the central macula and the uh, thickness of the retina is already starting to relax and achieve a more normal thickness. So this is post-op September 15, 2021. Pre-op was August 27th, so about three weeks later. There is already a nice reduction in the retinal thickness and you can quantify that by using the microns here in the center uh, they've already dropped about 70 microns in just three weeks. That's a, it's a very nice improvement. I tell my patients with epiretinal membrane um, that there's a 90% chance that the vision improves by one to two lines uh, on the eye chart over a year. So it's a very slow improvement. And the reality is that's a pretty conservative estimate. I've seen patients improve by three or four lines, but I prefer to uh, under-promise and over-deliver. The uh, retinal imaging, OCT, fundus photos are also incredibly useful for optic nerve pathology. I'll show you some nice examples here. So this is a uh, epiretinal membrane, lamellar hole, uh, cystic spaces in the nasal macula. Uh, you may think there's a PVD here. There's a little bit of hyaloid. It's kind of elevated there. Um, but if you get just the OCT macula, you may be missing the whole picture. So you zoom out a little bit, then you start to see there's a hyaloid attachment right here. And then if you focus specifically on the optic nerve, there's actually a hyaloid attachment, both uh, temporal and nasal to the optic nerve. So this sort of thing is very useful for surgical planning if um, epiretinal membrane surgery is going to be um, tackled. Here's another example of incomplete PVD um, with hyaloid attachments at the optic nerve. Um, but this patient actually has VPT, vitreal papillary traction. It's exerting traction on the optic nerve, creating pseudo-optic nerve edema, blurred disc margins here with cystic spaces, and it's due to this um, vitreal papillary traction on the disc. So this patient actually underwent surgery. I'll discuss that a little bit later with the uh, surgical planning. Here's another case of optic nerve edema with incomplete PVD, here's the posterior hyaloid, but this is massive optic nerve edema in a patient with untreated hypertension. The blood pressure was actually 240 over 120. This is incredibly high. Um, he was sent to the ER um, and he was treated for malignant hypertension with subsequent improvement in the optic nerve edema and the vision. Here's another patient with optic nerve edema, not quite as bad as the last case. You can see the, th the thickened optic nerve, very swollen here blurred disc margins on the fundus photo. Uh, but what's different about this case is if you look at the retina here, there's no intraretinal fluid. 
but there's retinal fluid with exudation here in this case. And so this is considered a neuroretinitis. It's inflammation in both the optic nerve and the retina. There's focal subretinal fluid under the fovea. And one of the most common causes of neuroretinitis is a infectious cat scratch disease, Bartonella. And this patient actually had a cat and uh, Bartonella serologies came back positive and she was treated with antibiotics with resolution of both the optic nerve and the macular edema. Here's another patient with optic nerve edema and hemorrhage. This is a CRVO, beautiful fundus photo on the Heidelberg multicolor. Um, she has intraretinal fluid cysts and large subretinal fluid. Visual acuity was decreased to count fingers. Uh, she first came to me in June of 2021. I'm still seeing her today. Her vision now is about 2040, and she needs an anti-VEGF injection about every six weeks. Um, the uh, retinal imaging is also incredibly useful for trauma and PVR, both for surgical planning and explaining the pathology to the patients. So here is a patient who sustained blunt trauma at uh, a establishment that distributes alcoholic beverages um, and uh, got into a little bit of altercation and um, blunt trauma resulted in 360 bullous subconjunctival hemorrhage. And so this finding in the setting of blunt trauma, especially without an orbital fracture, um, is basically op is an open globe injury unless proven otherwise. Um, so this patient requires open globe exploration. CAT scan here shows uh, some disruption, irregularity of the scleral contour there temporally, and some irregularities here in the vitreous cavity suggestive of a possible vitreous hemorrhage and or retinal detachment, more likely vitreous hemorrhage. So here was during the surgery, and this is the anterior lip of a scleral laceration. After dissecting the conge with a cut down, you can see this is the anterior lip of the scleral laceration. This is uvea. This is the choroid. And of course, retina is just inside of there. Here's a, another image shows a, sort of more the extent of the laceration. And this is after a closure with adult nylon sutures. But in the post-operative period, OCT macula confirmed the presence of subretinal fluid temporally, um, which is expected after a posterior injury of that nature. So the patient underwent uh, retinal detachment repair with silicone oil. So this was um, October 11th, 2021. And then here we are two weeks later and the retina is reattached. There's a slight sliver of residual subretinal fluid there, but that tends to resolve with time. And additional slices through the inferior retina and the retinectomy confirm that the retina is attached, again, with hyperreflective RPE in the, and uh, atrophic retinal layers in the areas of the laser scars. And here's a nice uh, color fundus photo showing the attached retina behind silicone oil and the bright yellow fresh laser burns at the border of the retinectomy. Here's another example of a patient with ocular trauma underwent open globe repair subsequent retinal detachment repair. This was after an initial bungee injury. They were trying to uh, apply a bungee cord to a, a malfunctioning trunk of their car. Uh, the bungee cord sprung back at them and hit them in the eye. Um, and so the OCT macula here shows the silicone oil meniscus, atrophic but attached macula. But if you scroll down, you start to see some focal subretinal fluid here. And so you want to get an additional additional slice inferior to determine if the retina is in fact attaching. And you can see here that it is. And so this patient required additional surgery. This was May of 2021. And now a month later after surgery, the retina is reattached in that area with the laser scars. Focal disruption of the retina here, likely from uh, peeling of PVR membranes, but the retina is attached on either side of it. So peripheral OCT is incredibly useful for preoperative and postoperative decision-making uh, in the setting of ocular trauma and PVR. 
Here's another example of the, uh, this is the same patient with the laser scars on either side of the focal retinal disruption and additional laser scarring in other areas with silicone oil reflections. And the macula remains attached, a little bit of thickening with the epiretinal membrane. And then here's a month later, stable exam, stable macula. And then four months later, this is October of 2021 now, remains attached. This is a SWAT team worker who uh, was trying to apprehend uh, a suspect and the suspect punched them in the left eye. Um, I'm sure you all have found that most ocular trauma occurs in the left eye as people punch with their right hand into the opposite person's left eye. So this is another left eye ocular trauma. And the patient has a subretinal hemorrhage and September of 2021 received three anti-VEGF injections. Here's after one, here's after two, and here's after three with um, multiple sessions of micropulse laser, which I use with certain indications for stimulating heat shock protein to promote RPE and retinal heal. Here's another uh, dramatic case of ocular trauma. This patient had a uh, fish hook injury in Central America, got on a plane and flew straight to Houston Methodist Hospital. I was on call and had the pleasure of removing this fish hook. Uh, the CAT scan shows that the hook went through the anterior chamber, through the lens, but very fortunately is spared uh, the posterior segment. So here's a photo of the fish hook removal. This is the barb of the hook. I had to use a 0.12 to evert the inferior lip of the wound to create room for this barb to come out. And so here's the fish hook now coming out of the eye. There's the corneal wound, and that's the entire hook. And here's the wound sutured with uh, three nylon sutures. Um, unfortunately, there was limited video capability with the overnight um, kind of older microscope we have in the on-call area of the hospital. Uh, this is a post-operative B scan showing dramatic vitreous opacities in that fish hook patient. So the patient required a vitrectomy in addition to anterior segment reconstruction. And the Heidelberg does a nice job, this is an undervalued trait, of taking um, anterior segment photos. And so you can see after the hyphema removal, after the cataract removal, the intraocular lens with the reflection uh, and the buried sutures here, uh, in the supranasal cornea, the um, very nice fundus photo. And here's the post-operative OCT. The retina looks pristine, slightly hazy because of the media, but uh, nice to show the patient uh, that there was a successful outcome. Here's some additional examples of uh, anterior segment photos that can be useful for documentation on the Heidelberg. Here's a patient with a traumatic cataract. Uh, here's a patient, uh, this is actually that ocular trauma patient with a bungee cord uh, documenting the ptosis for a subsequent ptosis repair we referred him for. Um, here's another patient, different open globe patient that required two corneal stitches here and here. Um, and here's a patient that had a traumatic iridodialysis. So the iris is in the correct position here and there's a dialysis of the um, of, of the iris right through the visual axis with a traumatic white cataract and inferior PFO bubbles in the anterior chamber uh, from a prior retinal surgery. So the uh, anterior segment photo on the Heidelberg captured a nice constellation of findings. And uh, here's an infrared anterior segment photo through the pupil demonstrating a bullous superior retinal detachment. So take home point here is that serial imaging offers documentation and guidance for you and your patient during their recovery from ocular trauma and or PVR. So we alluded to this in the previous section, but I'll hammer the point home with how I use um, retinal imaging for preoperative surgical treatment decision making. So this case of VPT, vitropapillar traction, the fact that we have such a good OCT demonstrating partial PVD over the macula, hyaloid attachments at the optic nerve, traction at the optic nerve, and an epiretinal membrane will inform how I make my decisions about how to approach the surgery. So this patient's getting a vitrectomy. We're going to cut and vacuum out the core vitreous. 
you're going to release the hyaloid. You're going to cut and release the hyaloid here. You're going to lift to induce a PVD and remove the posterior hyaloid with the, with the cutter. But then you're not done after that because the patient still has this epiretinal membrane. So then there's a second approach where you use the intraocular forceps. I like the ILM forceps to then peel the epiretinal membrane. So you're really attacking two layers with this one surgery. And so having high quality images helps you to plan for a case like this. Here's this example of the vitreous misbehaving at the fovea causing a macular hole. And again, knowing exactly where the posterior hyaloid is attached informs your surgical decision making on where you need to lift to induce a complete PVD prior to uh, injecting your ILM stain so you can get a, a proper stain of the internal limiting membrane, which you're then going to peel. If you inject your dye and you haven't induced a complete PVD, you're just going to stain the posterior hyaloid. And that's not the end of the world. You'll, you'll end up removing the posterior hyaloid after that, and then you'll have to restain. So you're just wasting time. It's incredibly useful also to image your diabetic patients in preparation for surgery. So you can see where exactly the diabetic membranes exert the most traction and where you need to cut and release. Again, pathology evolving from the posterior hyaloid, but this time this is diabetic posterior hyaloid and uh, fibrous vascular tissue. Here's another diabetic patient and the scans demonstrate posterior hyaloid attachments and NVD here at the optic nerve and at the temporal macula. And if you get a slice in more of the inferior macula, you can see again how the posterior hyaloid is behaving in relation to the macula, where you need to cut, where you need to lift to relieve the traction. The more you know about what's happening with the posterior hyaloid preoperatively, the better, because any posterior hyaloid that you leave behind after a surgery like this is just a scaffold for more preretinal membranes and traction to develop. Here's another example, getting a wide field 55 degree OCT like this one with the 55 degree lens um, gives us more of a bird's eye view of the fact that this PVD is only just partial. And in this diabetic patient, there may need to be a lift more peripherally if surgery is undertaken. Again, for preoperative timing, knowing exactly what extent of the retina is detached is useful. This is an incredibly urgent case. If it's a morning patient, you want surgery in the afternoon. Otherwise, the fovea may detach even if you wait till the next day. Uh, fundus photos also help to document. And then if you get an OCT on top of that, you can confirm PVD status in the setting of a retinal detachment to determine if hyaloid needs to be lifted or if preretinal membranes need to be peeled. In this case, there already was a PVD with this MAC-OFF retinal detachment. Here's a nice post-operative photo of that retinal detachment and post-operative OCT, focal RPE changes, but you can see vitreous here, surgically absent, and the retina is reattached with a nice foveal contour. Okay, switching gears again, um, preoperative diabetic surgical planning. If surgery was undertaken for a patient like this, this is a subhyaloid hemorrhage, boat-shaped classic diabetic subhyaloid hemorrhage proliferative diabetic retinopathy. OCT through the hemorrhage shows that the hemorrhage is completely pre-retinal in location just behind that posterior hyaloid layer right there. Scrolling up a little bit, you can see these focal vitreous opacities under a partial lifting of the hyaloid. This patient has a partial PVD in this area and some areas of hemorrhage between the hyaloid and the retina. Here's a preoperative photo of a different patient with a macula off retinal detachment. The optic nerve is here. This is all bullous detachment. This is the inferior arcade of a right eye. So this is inferonasal. Patient has this yellowish white lesion, trying to figure out what that is before surgery. Got an OCT through it, and it shows that it's localized to the nerve fiber layer. So this is myelinated nerve fiber layer. Nothing to worry about in the preoperative period of a retinal detachment. 
here's the patient's post-operative photo reattached very nicely. And I think this is the last case. Here is a traumatic, uh, actually not traumatic, diabetic subretinal hemorrhage. And uh, you can see that the uh, there is a partial PVD with areas of subretinal hemorrhage, both in the temporal and nasal macula. And scrolling down, this is the posterior hyaloid. And there is no PVD or very, very slight, very slight lifting. So surgical approach for this is going to involve lifting the hyaloid to gain access to this hemorrhage. And that concludes the talk. I think we have time for a question or two if there are any. And I appreciate you all tuning in. Um, I did have a couple come through already, Dr. Kavusi, so we'll go ahead and just fire away. Um, doctors always say that floaters mean no harm in most cases, but what are the signs or symptoms that make you think as a, ret a vitreal retinal specialist that floaters can be harmful and when surgery is recommended? So uh, I would define the word harmful as um, potential to cause irreversible vision loss. So the most harmful or dangerous floaters are those that are associated with peripheral retinal pathology. If the patient develops a PVD, and they're in that about 10% of patients or so who may develop a retinal hole or a retinal tear at the time of an acute PVD, um, those patients need treatment for the retinal tear to prevent a retinal detachment. So um, when patients complain of new flashes or floaters in one eye, especially if they're at the age where they could develop a PVD in their 50s, 60s, or maybe even in their 40s if they're a myope, um, then peripheral retinal pathology is my greatest concern. If there is no peripheral retinal pathology and it's just an issue of I have floaters and I'm bothered by the floaters, um, those in and of themselves are not harmful to, in, in terms of potential to create permanent vision loss, but they can be quite a nuisance. So then I counsel the patients that the brain has an opportunity to neuroadapt to the floaters over the next six months or so. If after a few months, you're still incredibly bothered by the floaters and um, they are too large or too much involving the macula such that you can't look past them, and I have plenty of patients where that's the case, then I think surgery is an option. And then I counsel them that the risk of um, retinal detachment or infection or other complication from the surgery is incredibly low. Um, depending on what data you look at, it's between less than one in a hundred to one in a thousand, especially if they already have a complete PVD and they're having vitrectomy for floaters, the risk is incredibly low. Um, but if the patients can live with the floaters and obviously no treatments needed for them. So it kind of depends on, you know, what's their level of symptomatology and how motivated are they to have surgery versus how surgically averse are they? Okay, great. Um, I think this one you kind of already answered, but I'm just going to ask again. Are there specific patient populations who are at greater risk to develop floaters, and are there any preventative measures a patient can take to reduce risk for floaters? Uh, I think I found just anecdotally that, that more nearsighted patients, uh, higher myopes, are at greater risk for developing more floaters. They also develop PVDs faster, so they're more likely to become symptomatic from their vitreous at a younger age than uh, patients who are not high myopes. Um, and floaters can increase after ocular trauma as well. So I'd say protect the eyes, no eye rubbing. Those are things you can do to prevent worsening floaters. All right, and last question that we received. Anterior segment images were shown in multicolor for pre and post-op evaluation. Why do you prefer imaging this way instead of with a standard slit lamp camera? What would be the benefit? You absolutely can do that, but in terms of patient flow, if you already have the patient getting posterior imaging, you can take the anterior segment image on the same unit without needing to switch them to a different camera. Um, but there are multiple ways to acquire a, a high quality, high resolution anterior segment photo. Okay. Okay, great. Um, well, we hope everybody found today's webinar educational. If you would like to be informed about future webinars, please try and like us on Facebook and Instagram. We would like to also extend an invitation to the International Spectralis Symposium, which is being held May 26th through 27th. It'll be a two-day forum surrounding various topics in posterior segment imaging.
You can register for this event as well as additional educational materials at www.heacademy.com. So thank you again, Dr. Kavusi, for your time and your, um, your cases today. And uh, audience, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.